Good evening, if I can have your attention. My name is Linda Siever. I am the Executive Director of the Havasu Community Health Foundation, and we are so very proud to extend our health and wellness to this wonderful event. I want to introduce uh, Tatum Bracamani. We've had the pleasure of working with the, the student advisories they are doing such an amazing job, and I'm going to let you, her tell you a little bit about Enjoy This Evening. We are so thankful to have this opportunity uh, and enjoy the evening. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Tatum Bracamani, and I'm from Havasu Youth Advisory Council. First, we would like to thank all the sponsors of this event. Um, hashtag you matter, Havasu Community Health Foundation, Lake Havasu City, Ed's Deli, Jimmy John's, and Campbell Cove and Food City. We would like to thank Katie McPherson for coming today, and now I'm going to introduce Bob Feliciano from Hashtag you matter to give us a few words. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Really quickly, I've been coming to Lake Havasu since 1974. When I came here, really very little existed. Uh, in 1970, 19, 2016, I decided not to work anymore. I was a professor back in Los Angeles, and my students told me, you can't retire, Mr. Feliciano. I said, I'm 76 years old, and if I don't retire now, you're gonna take me out in the box. Unfortunately, 10 years ago, I got a call from, actually they knocked on my door. I was a police officer 20 years. And my son, who was a student at UC Santa Barbara, took his life. Uh, he used a permanent solution to a temporary problem. It's the worst day of my life and it'll be the worst day of my life till I die. I can't save him. But I moved to Havasu and I found out we have a problem here in Havasu with mental health and suicide. And I got a hold of a few people from the school district, namely Doug, uh, and we came up with this group called You Matter. Our goal is to uh, educate the public that it's okay to have problems. It's okay to be sick. Uh, it's not okay to leave the earth prematurely. My son was 20 or seven uh, months and three days old. Uh, look at me, I'm an old fart. I'm 78 years old, it's not fair. Anyway, uh, our goal and objective is to spread the word that we can do better. We can save lives. All we have to do is talk to one another. I tell people a hug is worth a lot more than taking a pill. So with that, welcome. I talk too much, don't I? No. Welcome. Thanks for letting me get up here in front of you. And I'll turn it over to our student here. Okay, so now I will be introducing Katie McPherson, who is our keynote speaker for today. Katie McPherson brings experience in school leadership, prevention, and organizational change with over 23 years as a school leader. Katie's educational career focused on curriculum and instruction, social justice, leadership development, and digital citizenship slash social media responsibility, before going on to become a national consultant and executive director of the Gurian Institute. Katie has led initiatives on school safety, school culture and climate, brain-based teaching strategies, professional development for teachers and administrators in the areas of adolescent brain development, trauma-informed care, achievement gaps, as well as created a nationwide community and parent engagement series in the area of social media responsibility, teen suicide prevention, and social emotional learning principles. She has presented at numerous national conferences and has pub been published in the book, WTF, Why Teens Fail, What to Fix. Please help me welcome Katie McPherson. Thank you, Tatum. 
Thanks so much for having me here tonight. It was a beautiful ride up from Phoenix. Uh, I travel often, but coming here tonight means a whole lot to me. I had the privilege of meeting Bob Feliciano over the phone and now in person, and having the foundation have me here tonight is a great honor. Um, my day job is traveling across the country trying to save lives, little lives, big lives, and communities and families. So again, thank you so much for having me. My call to action is to create students that are real world ready. And my work as a school administrator taught me that we have a big gap between what parents believe may be best for their kids and what kids need from us. And so not only do I speak to rooms full of adults, but I work with students every day as well, both in Phoenix and nationally. So tonight is really just an overview. I think we could talk about all of these subjects for probably months on end. But tonight my goal for you is to walk out with some strategies and some practical tips to help your own students. And all of you are now my kids. So if you're a kid in this room, uh, I just took you on and I am here as a resource. If you're looking for any of the information that I shared tonight, you can find me at katiemcpherson.com. I post all sorts of resources, and if you need anything, I probably know somebody that can help wherever you are. So thank you again. Um, as I said, I've spent the last 23 years in a junior high or high school. I found that it doesn't matter what kind of kid you are, what kind of zip code that you live in, there are resources that we need. And so after supervising over 58,000 students, I know to be true that kids are awesome. And I, I feel very deeply that um, handing over some of these devices and some of the access that we've given them without any training has led to some things that we weren't prepared for. So tonight is really about becoming prepared for that. I think one of the things as a parent myself that I fear the most is something would happen to my students, something would happen to my daughters. I have four daughters, currently ages 10, 10, 12, and this week I'm 13. And so as I try to raise my own kids in the trenches with you, there are some things that are different about the I generation. So if you were born after 1995, you are considered an I generation kid. I call them I gen kids. Some of the things that have changed that you may or may not know about are the intersection of some of the major issues we're having as a nation. Two of them on this slide that I will point out for you. Hi. Two of the things that I'll point out for you tonight. Number one, the performance arms race. Kindergarten has a lot more rigor than it used to. And when I look at junior high and high school kids, and the choices they're having to make over taking fun classes, over taking something that's going to prepare them for post-secondary, it is very difficult sometimes, the pressure that they are feeling academically. The second piece that I would also point out to you is we've taken away recess. Some of the things that kids learn through rough and tumble play, that's how they learned how to set boundaries. When we tell kids that they have to stay in, or we isolate them, specifically our boys more than our girls. We put them in a double bind that they don't have an opportunity to move their bodies. The worst thing we can do for our students is to isolate them. And we continue to look at school discipline, we continue to look at the justice system, and that isolation doesn't work. And so hopefully, some of your schools are using restorative justice practices, and Kim Sterling and I talked about the courts. Having you here tonight, learning a few new things. I'm hopeful that as you move forward through the process of adolescence, you'll take those with you as well. Lastly, um, everything is bullying. After 1990, systemically, our schools were told, everything is bullying. If somebody calls somebody fat, somebody pushes somebody against the locker, somebody kicks somebody under the desk, it must be bullying. When we did that through the system, not just one school, but the system was told, that the adults on campus and the parents had to take care of everything, we took away the voice of our kids. In school language, we call that student agency. When a kid learns how to stand up for herself or for himself or for others, that's called agency. And when we tell kids that you can't handle your own problems, you need to go to the front office and report it, we take away a very huge opportunity for them to become socially competent and for their maturity to go way up. So I'm not saying that there isn't bullying and harassment that doesn't go on on our campuses. What I'm saying is typical daily growth.
growing stiff. We've taken away the opportunities for them to practice standing up for themselves and others. And I'll talk a little bit more about that tonight, but it is important to note as you look at why students are gravitating towards devices to convey their pain to others. And I'll talk about that pain as well. I always like to leave you with resources. These are some of my favorite books. Um, if you're parenting a boy or a girl, Saving Our Sons and Untangled will be your new favorite friends. You can download them, you can listen to them if you're a reader. I highly encourage you to purchase them. They will help you immensely with your children. A couple other books that I would also recommend. We're seeing a, a dramatic increase in anxiety and depression and self-harm, specifically amongst our young females. Um, the book Under Pressure came out a few weeks ago, and the book How to Raise an Adult specifically talks about what do you want your child to look like at age 25? What do you want them to look like, dress like, be like, talk like? What does success mean to your family? And it's going to look very different for every different child in a family. And so being really clear as adults as to how we can support them through that process, this book will give you tremendous strategies. I think most importantly, I want to thank you again for being here. I think nobody knows how to parent. Our oldest kids are our best experiments. And so perhaps you learn a few things with your oldest that you try with your middle that don't work, that you try with your youngest that do work. And so knowing that you're here tonight is a huge commitment and, and shows the dedication that you have to your kids. So thank you again for caring so much. I think from a school safety standpoint, when we look at what we have told children to do in a post-Columbine era, in a post-Parkland era, what we've told kids is, if you see something, say something. But it's still not cool to say something. And so we have to think about the mechanisms within our communities. Who are the trusted adults in their lives? Is it somebody's cool aunt? Is it my older sibling? Is it my soccer coach? It doesn't have to be apparent that a child tells that something is going on with their friend, something is going on with them. When we look at online behavior, our kids and the ones that are sitting in this room are doing a tremendous job helping each other with zero training. When we hand over devices, they are connected with great intensity, just like we were with the long cord through the bedroom around the hallway. Same thing, different media. So when we talk to kids about where can you find help, it is important to know that help seeking has gone up 168% in the last three years. ASU Tempe is not very far from my house. They have tripled the visits to the Mental Health and Wellness Center in the last five years. Tripled the visits. So that sounds bad. That sounds like, what is going on with these kids? But it's not bad. They are doing exactly what we told them to do. Go get the help that you need. And so if they are going to come to us for help, we need to have resources and people trained to receive them. Lastly, on help seeking, if you are a kid in this room and you are listening to my message, if you see somebody that needs something, I'd love for you to think about identifying putting the friend before the friendship. Often with our active school shooters, often with our suicides, kids will come forward. You see it every time on the news. They go and find a kid and the kid says, well, I knew he wasn't doing well. He was acting weird. He did say something crazy, but I didn't know who to tell. Or I didn't want to tell on him because two things. Number one, my parents will take my phone. And number two, I refuse to sell out the friendship. We've got to be talking to our kids about how do you put the friend before the friendship. We will save lives if we train our kids how and who they can come to. Part of what needs to happen, though, is they have to be able to go to you. You have to have open communication with them. The phone cannot be a pawn in our parenting game. And a lot of us, many of us, maybe most of us, have put this obstruction between ourselves and our children. And we've got to take the devices out of that game. We're losing our kids, not only 
physically, but spiritually, mentally, and their hearts need us now more than ever. So tonight I'll point out um, some quick strategies. I think most importantly, do not let technology lead you. You are an adult. You are an educated adult. You're here tonight to get some more tips. My goal for you in the landing page that I want you to walk out on is, how do I lead my family with technology instead of it leading us? Currently, the industry is winning. They're, they are making billions of dollars on the backs of our kids. We are fighting with our children over technology. And we're losing relationship because we haven't figured out this isn't an us versus them. This is us together as a family. We are going to be a digitally led family. It is almost 2020. It's time to step in and understand that it's not all bad, that technology is a futuristic tool. I'm hopeful that you got here because of technology. You found out about tonight because of technology. And so stepping into it and not fearing it will go so much farther for you and your family than fighting about it. I think Bob pointed out um, with his own son, there were some warning signs, there were some signals that he wasn't doing well. When you look at a public health model, a public health model calls for law enforcement, faith-based, all sorts of community nonprofits, parents, schools, educators, coaches, to come together. When we look at this well-being, many of our kids are doing really well. Some of our kids are moving into the lane of distress. Where we're missing the mark is that lane of distress. What is the difference between a kid having a really bad day and when do I need to go get help because he's sliding south or she's not doing well? The third piece is crisis. I don't know what your crisis resources are here in Lake Havasu. I live in Maricopa County. Ours are very limited for the amount of people we have in crisis. Don't wait until there's a crisis. Capture your kid in the safety net of distress. And most kids, most humans, including adults, have distress. We want kids to have some good stress. We want them to swing from well-being into distress. Where we start to get worried is where we can't get them out of crisis. And so I really encourage you to think about how is my kid doing on a daily basis? What are the nonverbals? What's the sleep pattern? What's the appetite like? What's the friendship group like? There are many things that we can pick up on without even having to ask many questions. I think if we're really gonna tackle this us versus them, we have to have a plan. We have to get clear. What does your own device mean to you? When I speak to students during assemblies or small groups or I have a bunch of teenagers over at my house, the number one complaint that I hear from them is, they want me off my device, but I can't get them off theirs. Many of us work from our phones. I am self-employed. My phone is my livelihood. And so I have to be careful and model for my own kiddos that I can put my phone down between the hours of three and six, that I'm engaging in homework, that we're eating dinner together, and that we're not alone together. I travel a lot. I look in restaurants. I look at airports. I look on couches. Many families are sitting together, head down, and they're alone. They're all alone together. And so really being intentional about having a plan. What does the plan look like? What are the non-negotiables of your devices? If we are handing 10-year-olds an iPhone 10 for her birthday, I trust you with the World Wide Web. And then she hits her brother. I don't trust you and then you're really tired after work tonight, give it back. Fine, you can have it back. And then, oh, you didn't do so well on your math? Give me your phone. We're all doing this exhausting dance. In the middle of that dance is this precious child that you would do anything for. And so a plan like this outlines for them. You're coming to the table and so am I. These are the non-negotiables of this device. If your grades aren't in line, this is the natural consequence. If your behavior is not in line at school and at home, this is the natural consequence. And your child or children have a voice in the own use of their device. I think it's important to note that anything that happens on the device, the 
that's in your name is yours. So anything that happens needs to be outlined in your plan. Kids will come to the table and they will negotiate. Anybody over nine, you can say to them, I want to negotiate with you. Anybody nine and under, you still have a little leverage to say no. So as you work on your plan, I think there are some really important things to, to think about, not only from a safety standpoint, but from a social emotional wellness standpoint. Bob pointed out some of the presentations that he gives on suicide prevention. Suicide's a very scary word. It's starting to become less scary because we're doing a lot of training on it. But part of suicide is lack of sleep. When someone is in complete distress or crisis, sleep is the number one factor that we look at as the underpinning of distress. We have to get these devices out of our bedrooms. Kids cannot be up all night on YouTube, Fortnite, etc. If you do nothing else, and this is where the kids start to hate me, is get the devices out of the bedroom. Good sleep dictates good moods, dictates good behavior, dictates you get your kit. So a central charging station where everybody's device goes in the off position overnight is a really easy fix. It's not pretty, it's gonna get worse before it gets better, but it is essential that our kids are getting at least eight to 12 hours of sleep. We could mitigate much of the anxiety, self-harm and depression that we see if our students were getting good sleep. And it's especially crucial through puberty, which starts at age nine through 18. And so we've got to really look at practical ways that we can tackle this. I think it's important to know, a nine-year-old's device use is going to be different than a 15-year-old's. Our high schools and our junior highs are using technology in the classroom. These are my set of twins. They came together, they couldn't be any more different. When I think about the three things that I am going to look at when I give them a device, how are their social emotional wellness doing? How is their behavior and how are their grades? It is a privilege to use technology. It is not a right. Unfortunately, the industry swept most of us up and we thought these were really cool devices too. And so it's become a right and we have to reframe it as a privilege. And so as you make your plan, when you think about what do I care the most about, typically people say, I care about grades, I care about behavior, and I want them to be well. Those should be three things that you take into consideration as you create a new plan. I think kids would tell you that they're tired of hearing two things. Don't be stupid and don't post stupid stuff. You're burning your brain out. And maybe a third, don't share body parts. That is about as much training that they get in digital citizenship. Most of our schools are not implementing a comprehensive every year pre-K through 12 program where they're hearing over and over the great pillars of digital citizenship. Not all screen time is bad. There's a huge difference between one of my daughters FaceTiming her grandmother, that's screen time, and being on Fortnite for five hours. I call that digital candy versus digital vegetables. So when you're thinking about how much screen time your child gets, and if in fact he or she is burning out their brain, look at the content, look at the context, and look at the connections. Many boys will spend hours on YouTube getting new strategy for Fortnite. That is a content, that is context, and it's a connection. It may not be your favorite choice, but sometimes they're making connections that actually strengthen friendships. Maybe not for four hours, but looking at what is good screen time versus what is bad screen time. The media would love for you to think that the world is falling apart and that all screen time is bad. And if you can reframe for your family that we're in this together and that it's not an us versus them, you are going to be a digitally led family. And that's really the goal. Technology is not going away, it's only advancing. And so as adults, we really need to bridge this gap that we have between us and our kids. So just to wrap up, staying in the know, having a plan, having a central charging station, 
I would also point out to you, a lot of parents say to their kids, you're never going to get into college if you post stupid stuff. How are you ever going to get a job if you don't stop posting stupid stuff? Well, first, we need to define stupid stuff. But we also need to think about the first place that an employer or a college admissions officer goes is to your child's platform. Google the name. If I'm hiring a teacher, I'm definitely going to Google her name. And whatever comes up, she has about five seconds to make a good impression with me. They're going to do that to your child. So doing random phone checks and checking out their profiles is really important for their future. We have really set them up for failure in that they have no training. We handed this over. We're trying to keep up. They're about 30,000 miles ahead of us. And so really thinking about what do you want the world to know about you? There are many kids in this room that I guarantee are genius campaign managers for themselves. The ice bucket challenge that everybody in the world participated in was started by a 12-year-old. Four billion dollars for ALS research. If we allow them to know that they can use technology for good, they will do it. But we have to make sure that our messaging remains positive versus negative. So just to wrap up on the plan about what we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect sleep. We're trying to protect their brains. Trying to protect their friendships and their self-esteem. Those are the things that we're trying to protect. So if you're going to fight for something, fight for that. Don't fight with them. Fight for them. That's where I want you to land tonight. Lastly, when we handled over phones, what is the value of this device? What is the function of it? And what is my desired outcome? Many people ask me many questions. One of them is the most burning. When should I give my child advice? What age should I give? And how much access should I give? Many 10-year-olds want a phone for their birthday. Many 12-year-olds want a phone for their birthday. I can't tell you what the perfect age is. I can tell you that none of them are ready for the medium that we've given. And so if you are going to give it, is the desired outcome safety? If the desired outcome is she walks home from school and I want to make sure she's safe, then Snapchat is probably not the best thing to give her. And so thinking about what is the outcome you want? What are the reasonable boundaries? And changing those as he or she ages. Each kid's going to be different. When I think about the students, I have written thousands of discipline referrals that ended in kids coming to a court-mandated <laughs> event on the front of devices. Prior to their second birthday, we have taken 2,000 photos of them. So if you're raising children wondering why on earth is she taking 79 duck face selfies with her tongue sticking out, you started it. You started it. Not only did you start it, but you continued it on every vacation, every dinner, every celebration she's ever had. And so really getting clear again about what have these kids seen? They're just playing monkey see, monkey do. And so perhaps on the next vacation, we only take 20 photos of the dolphin instead of 30. I'm not saying don't take photos. What I'm saying is, in the minds of our kids, this iceberg illusion, social media is an illusion. If I were to go to any of your platforms as adults tonight, I would see some beautiful families. I'd probably see some beautiful landscape. I would not see your backstage. I would see your front stage. So the top of the iceberg is what our kids see, that life has to be perfect. I have to check in everywhere. And life is to be documented, not to be lived. Our goal is to show them our backstage. Our goal is to talk to them about how you sacrificed, how you got here, what disappointments you had. That's the backstage. But I feel deeply, and I'm passionate about pointing out to kids, if someone isn't bringing you joy, unfollow them. If someone is harassing you online, stand up for yourself and report it if you can. This is an illusion. We're all guilty of it. It doesn't matter if it's an adult or a child. And so really understanding for yourselves, they're about 15 years ahead of us. 
and we've got to keep up, we've got to catch up. And the best teachers are your kids. I keep up with this by inviting kids over. I know everything that I know because teenagers like the ones at the back table teach me. That's how I know. So sit down and ask them. Play Fortnite with them. Play Minecraft with them. Play Roblox with them. Understand the attraction and what they need from you out of it. I think on a health and wellness front, it's important to understand the impact on the developing brain. This generation is the most inclusive generation we've ever had. They are the most civically active generation we've ever had. The election of 2020 will probably have the most votes ever. On that note, this generation is also the slowest to grow up. One of the things that's going on with their brains is their brains are constantly stimulated. The dopamine from the devices and from the video games is constantly dousing on them. And these companies do not care. These companies are after new users and money. And so when you look at this brain on the top there, that's a healthy brain, healthy blood flow. When you look at the bottom brain, you'll start to see blood flow is limited and neurons are falling apart. They're splitting off. The great news is neurons can regenerate. So if you were to look at the top brain, that would be a brain that was in the classroom. The bottom brain would be four hours a fortnight. And so where we worry is the untethered access that we've given, it's not giving fortnight. It's how long is that brain being driven into the brainstem? How long are you giving them access? And so as you look at when you pull them off, what are some of the behaviors that you see when you try to take the device away or try to take the game away? What are some of the behaviors you see? Any brave moms or dads? Rage. So rage is not your child. Part of the video game industry's biggest push is how do I keep this user's brain so agitated, so hyper, and so angry that they want to keep playing? And video games are genius, especially Fortnite, because there's no pause, pause button. Our schools need to welcome boy energy. It is 2019. We still haven't figured it out. Some of the messages that young boys hear at school, sit down, be quiet, keep your hands to yourself, stop running. Boy energy is not welcomed in our schools. Boy energy is welcomed hugely on our video games. The reason that some of our kids want to get on video games is I can be loud, I can be a boy, I can move objects through space, and it's novel, relevant, and fresh. Classroom, you gotta be a masterful teacher to teach in 2019 and welcome boy and girl energy in the classroom. These brains have been deeply impacted by the access that we've given. And so I feel very deeply for parents and children that are, are fighting over Fortnite or a video game because the industry, that is their goal. Their goal is to keep the user on as long as possible. I'm gonna just show you a short clip of Fortnite. If you haven't seen it, I turned the volume off, thankfully. Um, but I'd like you to count to eight seconds, so one and two and three all the way to eight. I'd like you to count how many scene changes there are throughout the scene. So that was about eight seconds. I'm gonna let it go a little longer. So if you haven't seen this or you haven't played it, imagine four hours of that. With the volume on, it is very hyper-stimulated. When you as mean mom or mean dad go to take that user off of that video game. The brain is saying, I'm not saving the world. I need my dopamine rush. So it is not your child. The best two strategies I can give you for your user, move his or her body and drink water. That will immediately dissipate the cortisol and the dopamine and that user will remain at a, a decent baseline. If you try to talk to that brain, it's gonna be an issue. And so some of the things that we do actually agitate the brain more than they help the brain. So um, I'm gonna start to wrap up. I think there are four things that every human being needs. And you live in a beautiful place that is more than ample to provide it. 
nature, movement, physical connection, physical touch, and connection. As I already uh, spoke about, recess. When we took the ability for kids to be able to touch each other as they played away, we took away being human. When we told teachers about 12 years ago that you can't hug your kids anymore, you can't hug your students, because unfortunately a couple people took advantage of that, we took away teachers' ability to be human. The best thing you can do for these children who are sometimes tethered to devices is to hug them for eight seconds every morning and eight seconds every night. It will balance out the oxytocin in their body, it will balance out the serotonin, and you will have a happier human being. It also goes for spouses, so you can try that too. Eight second hug in the morning, eight second hug at night. Um, some of, I noticed and I met a couple of law enforcement officers here, and I know Kim Sterling is here from the court. Um, we've got to get clear about bullying. We've got to get clear about online harassment. Human beings have two choices with pain. I'm either going to transmit it, which means I'm going to lash out at somebody else, or I'm going to transform it. Anybody under the age of 30, maybe 25, depending on your situation, has not learned how to transform pain. So when we hand a 14-year-old a device, and that brain is amped up and ticked off, they're going to transmit their pain. And they do it every day, all night long. And so we've got to get really clear about training kids. When you are upset, the device is not the go-to. What are some other things that we can do? This chart kind of shows in the late 80s, early 90s, where we said to kids, you can't handle your own stuff. You've got to go to an adult. And so we have a lot of kids that are saying, mom, what should I do? Dad, what should I do? Teacher, what should I do? I'm going to encourage you depending on the situation. Push back on your kid a little bit. Your children are fully capable of standing up for themselves and others, whether it's in person or online. If we don't encourage them to take care of it in person, they will go online, and then the story gets legs. I can't tell you how many times I wrote a referral on something that happened on a Saturday that came to school on a Monday that ended up involving the police on a Tuesday. The story gets a lot of legs if we don't teach kids how to have social confidence. When I think about what kids need to know from us, the word respect, I probably say it maybe 10 to 17 times a day. This generation is tired of hearing the word respect because they're watching a world that doesn't respect each other. It doesn't matter if it's TV, radio, online, they have a constant media stream. And so one word that I'd love for you to start thinking about using is the word dignity. The word dignity means inherent worth, that no one has the right to take away your child's dignity. My job as a school administrator and as a parent is if my child or a student comes to me and says, Chloe was really mean to me today, she told me to you know what, that my response to her is not, oh, well, why don't you go find some new friends? Or did you try to ignore her? I'm pretty sure that a kid coming to me has already tried everything they can. What dignity means is no one has the right to take your voice away from you. And at the base of what bullying and harassment and intimidation is, is one kid or an adult trying to take the voice away from your child. And our job is to make sure that they know that their voice matters and that no one has the right to do that to them. And so as I work with kids, the difference between dignity and respect. Dignity is, you're worthy and so am I. The respect comes later. If a kid just slams another kid into the locker and calls him a beaner, I am not going to ask that kid to respect that other child until his dignity has been heard. It is unrealistic as parents and school officials to ask students that have had their dignity ripped away in front of a whole peer group to go and respect somebody who didn't have respect for him and did not uphold their dignity. Dignity comes first, respect comes after. 
And respect needs time and space and reparation, time to repair the relationship. Sometimes it happens in 30 seconds, sometimes it takes two weeks, sometimes it's not repairable. Yet we as adults want everybody to feel really good, and so we're like, you gotta say sorry. Did you say sorry? Go tell her you're sorry. And we force inauthentic apologies all the time. And then kids turn around and they're like, my parents don't get it, I'm not gonna go to them. And so dignity is a huge piece of how we can get more mature kids, more social competence, and an easier way to mental health and wellness. And so as I look at um, the three basic needs that kids have and humans have, I want to be seen, I want to be heard, and I want to be loved. If we can't give them that in person, somebody online will. And I'm sure the law enforcement officials in this room will share with you time and time again how young girls and young boys get taken in by somebody who sees, hears, and loves them immediately without your knowledge. And so we've got to meet the attachment needs of our kids. If you're fighting about devices, you're not seeing and hearing and loving what they're saying. You're more interested in the device than you are about the heart. So we've got to get back to the heart of the matter. So I'll um, close out just on some important safety and protections. If you've given internet access to a three-year-old, to a nine-year-old, to a 14-year-old, everything that's listed on the slide, they've been exposed to. Parents are typically horrified when I tell them that the average viewing age of pornography is nine years old. Nine years old. So if you're not talking to your child about changing bodies, about curiosity, about changing bodies, you need to start having courageous conversations. I operate on the rule of five. Five years ahead of when your child is going to be exposed to something, you need to start conversations. And every year after, you need to fill in more details. The internet is teaching them everything that you don't want them to know. And so it is tough to have those conversations, but it is important that you are the ones that they can come to to talk to you about it. So many people look at this slide and they're like, oh my gosh, I've got a big job ahead of me. Yep, we signed up for it, we committed to it, and we're here. And so I would encourage you to really think and talk to your kids about some of those issues that maybe you have fears of that they already know way more about. This is a typical example of a student in distress. Instagram allows our children to make anonymous pages. It allows them to share content that you may not know about. It is typically called InstaHarm. So this is a paragraph about one of my um, friend's daughters. There's nothing that Hayden, the page is called I Hate Hayden. There's nothing Hayden can do about this page. She can report it to Instagram. They don't care. They don't care. And their response is not very timely. So what do you do as a parent to support your child through something like this? It is not a direct threat to her life, so it's not a law enforcement issue. It is not a school issue because it happened outside of school. Certainly, when she goes to school, it upsets her. Certainly, she thinks it's somebody at school that created the page. But this is not a school issue. It is not a law enforcement issue but it sure is a hate an issue, and it's a parenting issue as well. And so knowing that this kind of content and things go on, it goes back to the transmission of pain. Um, I don't think much has uh, changed in girl world since I was growing up, but I would call your attention to number seven, always in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, which I then must post. That's an important piece to understand if you are raising a young female. There is a tremendous amount of pressure to compare yourselves to others. Many of these sites are photo-based, so body image is a huge issue. I also think it's important that you know there is content online that would probably knock your socks off. This is a very typical post on Instagram where kids are posting about taking their lives. There is a whole community of people talking about, how are you gonna do it? This is how I'm gonna do it. You have to know what you're handing over. 
Many people ask me, how does she know how to starve herself? How does she know how to cut herself? How does she know how to do this? Voila. Hashtag thinspo. Hashtag cut myself. Hashtag kill myself. And so when we look at different opportunities and content that is out there, this is not like something I dug for. This is just the top surface of what's going on on the internet. And so when we look at kids that are in distress, when kids are looking for opportunities to connect with others that are also in distress, they find a community and an algorithm. If I pop on this page once a day, Instagram starts sending me more of it and more of it and more of it. And so you have to know what's out there and your kids have to be able to come to you. This is probably the best resource I can leave you with tonight if you're interested in learning more. How do I set my YouTube settings? How do I get a router that will filter out pornography and explicit and vulgar material? Smartsocial.com is the most comprehensive resource that is currently out there. It is pretty pathetic that in almost 2020, I only have one real resource that I feel that can give you everything you need. If you want a tutorial about how do I lock down YouTube so my younger children can't access content, there's a video there that is about 10 minutes long. It is worth your time to pop on Smart Social to understand how this goes down. My last piece for you tonight, when we think about students that are in distress, well before they are going to do something to harm themselves or to harm others, they will tell somebody else. They tell friends. They post about it. If you are not doing random phone checks, if you do not have login and passwords for the platforms your children are on, if you do not have the password to get into the actual phone, you need to have that information. I can't tell you, and I'm sure the law enforcement officials here tonight again will tell you how important it is to have that information. The phone is yours. You're in a relationship with it via your children. But coming together and really saying, you know what? I didn't realize how much was out there that you're up against. I'm here for you. I want to learn more about this. It will save your student. It will truly save your relationship, and it will save their lives. And so I want to thank you again for being here tonight. I'm going to pass it over to Ella. Um, we're going to have a, a panel of different people, and Ella is going to introduce them. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Like Katie said, my name is Ella Wofford, and I am a Havasu Youth Advisory Council member. And I would just like to personally thank Katie for her message, and it was very like informative and helpful and useful and I know that we're all going to take something back from that. So right now we are going to have a panel with some key Havasu players and I would, if you're on the panel please come up to the stage and I will introduce everyone. So first we have Mayor Cal Sheehy. He's a longtime like Havasu City resident and a graduate of LHHS. He served for four years on City Council and was elected mayor in 2018. Cal enjoys serving the residents of our community and is excited to move the Cavasu City forward as mayor. Next, we have Chief Dan Doyle. Right there, yes. Chief Dan Doyle joined the Cavasu City Police Department in 1988 and was promoted through the ranks and was appointed Chief of Police in 2006. During his 31-year law enforcement career, he has worked in a variety of positions in, of command in both operational and support service functions. He has two sons, Jake, age 18, and Josh, 15. Next, we have, Cam we have Cammie Kastanen. Kastanen, sorry. Cammie has a bachelor's of, science, a, a, a bachelor's of Science degree in Human Services with a focus on child development. She currently is employed under the Havasu Community Health Foundation as the Student Assistance Program Coordinator. The Student Assistance Program, or SAP, is a program adopted from Phoenix that provides peer-to-peer -peer support groups for students that have various stress factors in their lives. The groups are often a safe place for students to share and meet other people. Uh, we have SAP groups at all Lake Havasu Unified Elementary Schools, Thunderbolt, HPA, and Telesis. Next, we have Sue Blair White. 
who is known for her commitment in assisting individuals, families, and community treatment agencies and achieving their full potential by working collaboratively with all involved entities. She works within and in, in, and in collaboration with the local, county, and state agencies right now with the Mojave County Public Health Department. And she's a trained trainer, so she conducts state and national trainings of all facets of evidence-based programs. So with that, we would like to start our panel, but I have a couple questions, but does anyone have a question in particular for anyone on this panel? Raise your hand and I will come to you. No, no one? Okay, that's fine. You can ask them later. So, um, I am going to start out with uh, just a general question for anyone. So, how would, you, how would you begin a dialogue if you were to ask someone like what they were struggling with or what they were feeling? So, who wants to start? Well, in the groups, um, it, when we're in group, uh, the students actually learn how to ask each other um, how they're feeling, what's going on. We have check-ins, um, highs and lows. Um, so right away, they get to talk about what's going on in their life. Yeah, one of the things that I found out, I mean, obviously I'm a seasoned counselor, is I don't ask a lot of questions. What I do, my primary question to people of all ages, believe it or not, not just children who have difficulty telling you how they feel, is what color is it? And I have color charts and I have crayons so that they can pick it up and say, this is what color it is. And if it's red, I'll say, oh my gosh, what does that feel like? And usually they're going to pound their hand on the table and say, or jump up and down and say, that's what it feels like. So that's my number one tool that I use, all ages. Um, Chief, do you have any experience with that as a law enforcement um, officer? How do you do that if you're working? Well, we don't really work in group set, uh, group settings. Uh, typically, when we contact somebody, it's already a high stress situation. But uh, I, I think when when we're trying to deal with somebody, the first thing you got to do before anybody is going to tell you how they feel or share any uh, intimate feelings with you is you have to develop trust with them. So um, what we do is try to calm the situation and actually um, uh, initiate a dialogue with somebody and. Uh, get them to relax and, and try to earn a little bit of trust and, and get them to tell us what's happening and, and how we can best uh, assist them and get them the help they need. Anyone, you guys wanna go for this or you? Yeah, yeah I'll take it from a, a perspective of just as a friend. So, you know, with the, with the people that we're close to, so family members, friends, uh, we know if someone's having a bad day and so we can can hopefully from a, an angle of trust and, and understanding we can just start that conversation and being kind and having a nice smile and a nice warm greeting to somebody that you know might be having um, a hard day or a hard time uh, can make all the difference in the world so again at the very surface level we, we generally would know how our friends and our family um, are feeling or if they're down and just to, to kind of reach out and give them a, a care and let them know that you're there for them and allow them to open up uh, to what they feel comfortable with. I can just share, um, being a female administrator working with a lot of boys in my office, um, the disservice and the mistakes I made trying to get boys to talk. Um, moving their body and being shoulder to shoulder in the car or on a walk with you will get you way more information as opposed to saying, look at me when I'm talking to you and use your words. Um, the brain gets overloaded with too many words, especially if they're already feeling like they're in trouble with you. And I think secondly, um, I work with an awesome therapist in Phoenix, and he said to me the other day, when a, when a person's riding a horse, who's in charge, the horse or the rider? And I'm like, well, the rider. And he's like, yep, but what happens when the horse gets spooked? And I'm like, oh, the horse is in charge. So the moral of the story is, don't try to talk to a spooked horse. You've got to wait until the horse is self-soothed or has some time 
for the brain to be ready to have that conversation. And so for me, um, as a school administrator, my job was to make sure kids got back to class and if I needed to give them a consequence, I did. Um, I didn't give the brain enough time to calm down to not talk to the spooked horse. So that has really helped me going forward. Thank you for those answers. Question check, anyone? No? Okay. So Mayor Sheehy, I noticed that we have a lot of uh, community members, council members here. So what is the city doing to try to reduce the stigma and um, kind of creating this prevention awareness? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. Uh, the more opportunity that we have for events like this and to start the conversation is, is where we play a pivotal role. So we, we come to this and we have uh, Council Member Lynn uh, is here with us, Vice Mayor Lane is here with us, um, and we, we are able to take the stigma away from uh, uh, the word suicide or the uh, opportunity that someone might be struggling and how we can address it. So from a, a, a service level, we're able to have these conversations, come together, connect with citizens, connect with each other so we can identify any uh, far-reaching goals that we can uh, put in place to be able to, to solve it from a, a much larger level. Uh, but the city's role is to, to really be someone that can start the conversation and, and bring the relationships together that we can solve uh, whatever issue might be out there uh, for, for that. Thank you. So obviously, we're everyone here, we're not professionals in dealing with mental health issues and stigma so how can we as community members start to break down that stigma the one slow, like very slowly i think for me especially when you're talking about suicide if you could replace the word suicide with problem solving um, especially as we look at youth um, suicide is a story of intolerable pain and when i look at what students say online and in person Typically, they're talking to you or to their friends about how much pain they're in. When a, a brain goes into suicidal ideation, the only thing that brain wants is to get out of that pain. And so if you can think about the word suicide and put that aside, because that may scare you, think about how am I helping my kids or my family member or my brother solve this problem. Um, it's slow, it's steady, it's empathetic, it's sitting in the ditch and not saying a whole lot. I think um, we can reduce stigma by having events like this and bringing together all sorts of different people. Um, tonight you've all been charged with being an ambassador to reduce the stigma by sharing one thing with somebody who's not here tonight um, to help in this collective effort of the city. So thank you so much. Um, we teach the kids in group that uh, kids tend to pick on other kids because they might not know what it is. It might be unfamiliar to them. Um, so we try to teach how to get that conversation going. So if there's something different about somebody and they're being picked on for it, we try to teach them on things to say and also uh, how to we teach them about compassion and what that looks like. Any questions at all for, uh, for about Katie, what her um, program, or about for any of these panelists? Oh, okay, all the way back there. I, I got you, Alyssa. Give me a sec. Everybody else should be thinking. This question is for the police chief. What options are available available to us when we encounter a person who's con contemplating hurting themselves or in need of assistance? Yeah, that, if you just turn that mic on, it should be working. No, no such luck, I guess. Imagine that technology, it's got a power button. Um, 
Well, one of the things is, is when the police department gets involved is we frequently get that. That's a very common occurrence that we'll get a, we'll get a phone call, whether it be from a parent, a friend, or any other family member, that uh, um, somebody is either threatening to hurt themselves or um, just acting, acting out in a manner that they need help. So one of the things we do is, is when we get involved is we can refer people. Uh, we have Mojave Mental Health. Uh, we also have other counselors available to come out. And there's other community resources. But um, I, I think the biggest thing that uh, we try to do is, is to get involved and, and right away to get with them that harming yourself isn't the only answer. And I think that most people, whether they're a child or they're an adult, when they get to a point where either they're contemplating suicide or they're talking about it, they're, they're getting to a point where they feel like that is the only out for them, um, for whatever reason, I think we try to introduce them that, that, that that's not the answer. There are, there's other mechanisms, and then really putting them in touch. Um, as I said we use Mojave Mental Health uh, quite frequently. Um, we also have other um, uh, uh, psychologists and stuff that work through the hospital that we can get people help with. So uh, again, and, and, and I'll throw this in to parents, especially, is sometimes we as parents tend to minimize uh, the problems that their children are having. In other words, you know, we think, well, gosh, yeah, I got to work all day, I got to pay the mortgage, I got to do, all I got big problems, and um, you know, you've got this little problem. Well, it doesn't really matter. It's it's uh, the problems that our our children are dealing with are as big to them as our problems are to us, and I think that we have to take those seriously and uh, talk to them about them and give them the uh, the opportunity. And trust me, I know this from working with youth for, for over three decades, but also being a parent. I have two boys, so I really relate to how to deal with boys, and, and uh, you're absolutely correct, um, is taking their, uh, taking their problems seriously and listening to them and, uh, and, and working with them and talking to them and knowing when they're ready to talk because when boys don't want to talk, they're not going to talk, and it's just going to get ugly. Um, but putting them in a situation where they can talk. So th these are all things to do. Is and, and if I can get it across, especially to all of our young people that are here right now, is hurting yourself in any way, shape, or form. That that's that's not the answer. You know, there there's things you can do. There's help out there. There's people that love you. There's people that uh, are here for you. You have a great support system. Everyone that's here right now, you have a support system of your parents. You have a support system of all these organizations that are here. Your city leaders support you. Uh, we have school resource officers in your school. They're there to support you. So um, I think really focusing on this entire network, your teachers are there to support you. Uh, you look at all the, the, the uh, teachers that are here, and, and uh, you know obviously they care about you. So that's kind of my two cents. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions? At all? Do we have any? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm blind today. Where is that question? Okay, what is the best way to have your child be able to recognize a true suicidal tendency when there's mental health within the family? So they're coming to you saying, I think this person's going to hurt themselves, or you're asking for warning signs? Um, more so along the, the warning signs, when there's already, depression is already out on the table. Um, PTSD is already out on the table. Um, things that genetically known are already out on the table. So those things that are already already aware of, oh, well, they're just having a bad day. Oh, um, oh, they'll get over it in a minute. They'll be fine in, in a couple hours. How do you differentiate when it's true suicidal tendency is out there as opposed to, oh, that's just how they are. They got brain damage, whatnot. I think it's important to note that every single individual is different. I think we haven't done a great job of teaching children that it's okay to ask a friend, if they're a tween or teen especially, of a friend. Are you going to hurt yourself? Are you thinking of hurting yourself? There's a myth out there in the prevention world that has dispelled it, but not well enough, that asking someone, are you going to hurt yourself, is not planning an idea. That brain is actually looking for somebody to intervene. 
but unable to ask for help. So often the media will say, you know, if you're struggling, call this hotline or text this hotline. And so recognizing that if there is already a family history outlining for kids in the family, that hey, we already have this in our family and we need to take it seriously. Here are some strategies, here are some things that we can do. If it's an adult talking about a child, I think it goes back to what the chief outlined. Our one-liners and responses to our kids often really stink. We say things like, you'll get over it. I broke up with somebody in 1999 too and I'm fine. Look at your mom, she's awesome, I found somebody else. Um, have you tried to ignore them? Like we do all of these things where we dismiss the pain. Especially in my experience and statistically, the warning signs for males are very cryptic. A teenage male that is experiencing typical yucky day and a teenage male that is planning on hurting himself, the statistic nationally is 15 minutes to two weeks to completion. That is a very, very short window of time. So when looking at the students in our area who have completed suicide, I, can't, I can give you a whole list of warning signs for one kid, but it was completely opposite for the other. Some commonalities, lack of sleep, lack of appetite, lack of motivation, and or on the flip side, being super joyful when things have always been really negative. Um, I think it's also important that um, Firearms in the home are restricted. Um, when somebody attempts, when we look at completions, for every completion, there are 25 attempts. So really educating the family member on, we have a family genetic history of this. This is something I need you to sit down with me and take seriously, because imagine what could happen if we didn't. And that is, that's not a one and done conversation. That's an ongoing, pervasive, and perhaps exhausting for you conversation with that person. Okay, thank you for that question. That really shed a lot of insight for all of us. Um, Cami, as a student, I really appreciate the student assistance program. I think it's really great that students have an opportunity to have some like peer time, but I noticed that there's one, there's not one at the high school, but how do students in those programs, how do they find themselves like to get there, what are the, what's the steps? Um, well, sometimes um, they have a lot of behavioral problems to where the principal meets with the teacher and they're kind of mandated to be in our groups. Um, other times, uh, I have parents call and say that they're going through a divorce or um, grandparents calling and saying that, um, you know, mom or dad is going to jail or something significant happening in their life to where uh, they want that support. And our service, it's, SAP is free. So it's not counseling, but it's, su it's support for each other, for the peers to learn how to support each other. We meet once a week, but the kids see each other every day for a good part of their day. So it, whatever they're going through, however they sign up, um, it's all different, and we like for it to be a range of different things so that they can, you know, sometimes they find they have a lot in common with each other, and that will kind of bond them as a group, and that's good. Um, so yeah, but a lot of different reasons. Sometimes uh, kids will join because they're friends in the group, <laughs> and that's okay too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, any other questions before we wrap up here? No. Do we have any last pieces of advice or things you want to say? Um, so I've been doing this out on the road thing for about three years. And what I can tell you is we're starting much too late. Um, our high school peer-to-peer -peer support programs are awesome. And so are junior high, middle school programs. But we really need to start looking at third grade. Um, the coping and resiliency skills. If you are a parent in this room and you care about little kids, and you know they're gonna be big kids. Peer-to-peer um, -peer support is the number one way kids wanna support each other. So perhaps a creative idea would be that at the school level there would be a club that is called something cool, like ASU calls theirs Devils for Devils, and it's kids taking care of other kids, and it's run by a school counselor, a social worker, or somebody from behavioral health. 
We cannot wait until ninth grade to teach coping and resilience. We're seeing self-harm as early as third and fourth grade, especially if we've given devices. So I would encourage you collectively um, to think about starting the peer-to-peer -peer support um, school-wide in elementary school and keeping that going. I think you'd much rather hear from another peer that's trained than one of us old fogies. So I'm a huge, huge supporter of peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, I'll just add to that, Katie. Thank you for saying that because um, our SAP is in all the schools in Lake Havasu, and we have groups from kinder all the way up to 12th grade. Just not at the high school, just charter <laughs> schools all the way up to 12th grade. Anything else from our panelists? I'll say one thing when it comes to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, especially to all the young people out here, when we talk about the stigma, there's nothing wrong with it. It's We're all doing it. In police and fire, we've actually, for many years now, is we have these groups. When we go to a very traumatic uh, scene, we come back and we have uh, these peer-to-peer -peer groups where we allow the police officers and the firefighters and the medics and everything get together and they talk to each other about how what happened, how they feel about it, because, uh, and, and it works, it, it's very, uh, very effective. Um, so if you have that opportunity and you're having an issue, take advantage. It, it doesn't mean anything is, is wrong with you or that it's wrong or that it's, it's a stigma. It's not, it helps. That's what we do as human beings. We talk to each other. And uh, um, I just, I would encourage you to do that. So from uh, my perspective, one, thank you everybody for being here today and being a part of this. This is uh, really uh, being part of uh, how we can, can uh, uh, do better in this area. So thank you for, for taking the time uh, to do that. Um, also know that uh, you know life sometimes gives, uh, gives us some difficult uh, times, but it's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be hard. So this too shall pass. Um, and if you ever um, need any assistance, know that, uh, that your community and your set of resources is here for you. All of the folks that are sitting next to you are in this room, are, are in blue shirts, are uh, sitting up here, are around. We all care. And so anytime there, there is some uh, need, let, let someone know. Just reach out and, and we can make sure that, that you're taken care of. You are all uh, great people. And again, thank you for being here. school uh, they offer a lot of other groups so we were not there we brought um, bloom 365 in to teach them about healthy relationships but uh, they have amazing counselors and other support groups that they have at the high school I just wanted to say something about peer-to-peer -peer support I um, I'm kind of on a bandwagon and have been for many years in regard to peer-to-peer uh, -peer support uh, for parents, parenting groups. I mean, if you're a first-time parent, which a lot of us have been there, it's like, what is age-related behavior and what is behavior I really need to be concerned about, especially nowadays with the opioid crisis, et cetera. And so I really believe in peer-to-peer -peer for youth, but also for parents. I would like to see a lot more uh, parents start talking and knowing what they need to start talking about. I think that would be invaluable. So that's my two cents. Um, also, uh, something that was said earlier about uh, boys not wanting to talk. I raised three boys alone, and that is so true. They don't talk, and I'm always like, why aren't you talking to me? But I actually found a solution that worked, because I tried everything. I had just a simple suggestion comment box and it was in a central location and they could write me a little note and I can answer back on a little note and it saved us it saved my family something that simple yes yellow group in the chart is there any like specific age that children should be exposed to like the yellow group That was a really good question. So there's a chart up here on Smart Social. It's updated daily because there are thousands of apps out there. So the green, yellow, red, um, 
when you look at the green, that doesn't mean that you can't be mean on those or that those are awesomely safe. What it means is those are US-based companies. The yellow is where you start moving into kind of slippery slope. Things are probably not as safe and some of those are offshore companies. The red, and this is outdated, there are thousands more out there, but um, the red is no human being should ever have those. And so if you are, if you are on smart social, you will see that they will give you the green, yellow, red. So to answer your question, um, all app companies, and, and they're being held accountable now, say that 13 is the age that you are allowed to sign up for social media. Unfortunately, as we know, kids can put in any age and get on these apps if given the opportunity. Um, the United Kingdom is currently overhauling the statute of care and duty of care so that um, these companies will be held accountable, um, but it's going to be a long time before that happens in the U.S. I think I saw, yes, another question. So, I mean, like, I don't want to, like, sound rude or anything, but I know that we have counselors and we have groups at the high school but being one of the high school students, I feel that we need to have a group where kids who are suicidal can go and talk to others instead of just walking around with their head down and their headphones in, because I see that a lot at school. And I go up to them and I make sure they're okay, but sometimes we just need that group that we feel secure in. And Thank you for that comment. I know I will take that back to our school and we will make that a reality. Um, anybody else? Um, I okay, so as a parent, I have a 13 year old daughter and she actually uh, mentioned to me that she knew somebody who was unhappy and possible possibility of thinking of suicide. And we're very close, she's open with me, and she um, is basically like, don't worry mom, I'm gonna look out for him. He talks to me, we walk together. Uh, she's keeping an eye on him, but what can I do as a parent? And try to, I mean, should I talk to his parents? Should I tell the school? Should I say anything? Because I don't want to lose her trust as well as his, because I don't, I don't know him very well. I haven't officially met him yet. So what can I do? Um, like Katie was saying before, I, I think just having, asking those questions, even though they're uncomfortable, um, I would definitely get to know them, but that's, I, like, again, with my three boys, I always had kids over to my house constantly, and I would talk to them. If you came to my house, be prepared, I would definitely have a conversation with you, but um, getting to know the kids and asking those questions um, that might seem like you, you know, taboo or you, you can't ask, but I, it could make all the difference. So I would say give your daughter the tools on what you know, the verbiage to, to ask those questions. Yeah. I think, um, and I'm gonna refer back to you as well. I don't know if you heard um, her voice when she expressed how hard it is and the pressure these kids are under. I can hear it in your voice, how worried you are about the student. I think this is where the village has got to disarm as parents. We have to have the courage to adult. If, if she's walking home with him, he's your kid, and you are a mandatory reporter in this village to do something about it. And so there's a couple different anonymous ways you can do that. You have school resource officers. You can leave an anonymous phone call and say, I need you to have eyes on this kid. I don't know the whole story. Could you please check in? You can also um, call the school counselor or assistant principal are usually pretty awesome people that can also do drive-bys. I did a lot of that as an administrator administrator where the child had no idea that I was checking on them, but I'm looking at grades, I'm looking at behavior, I'm making courtesy phone calls home to parents, 
If you do have a relationship with the other parent, I think this is the toughest part for moms specifically, is we have this notion that the other mom is gonna get mad at us. And we have to disarm that whole parenting judgment thing and recognize that if we are truly for school safety and the safety of our community, that these are the types of opportunities we have to model for our kids. There's a difference between you telling on somebody and a safety issue. And what you're telling me is, this is bigger than you, and it's bigger than me as your mom, so I'm gonna go find us some help. And if he gets mad at you, or if you're upset with me, we'll deal with that, but the reality is this is a true safety issue. Thank you for those tips. Um, last question at all. I saw your hand first. So as far as the high school, why do I not see any representatives from Lake Havasu High School actually here? Why is it that I only see the middle school and also the elementary school representatives, but I have not seen a single LHHS representative besides reporters and different people from the school, students, why do I not see them here actually participating in anti, you know, suicidal events? I mean, every single day I walk around, I see another kid and another kid and another kid who's in a hole of depression and sadness, who wants to kill themselves. Why don't I see the Havasu High School here? And why do I only see the elementary school here and the middle school here when the real problem is in our high school? Um, as a high school student, I cannot speak to. So, huh? Huh? Oh, Miss Gump. Miss Gump's here. Hello, Miss Gump. Do you have anything? Do you want to say anything at all? So at the high school, we do address this issue. Um, all throughout the year, if any student has a comment. But one of the things we're trying to teach at the high school, if you know someone or someone tells you, tell an adult. Because then we can address it and we can address it with the family. We had our, all our ninth and 10th graders learn of this this past year, that if you, any student makes any comments, tell an adult. It could be the teacher if that's who you trust, it could be your parent if that's who you trust, but we need to make sure that that other child, your friend, is being heard. And again, it's about putting the friend in front of the friendship. We talked about, we had lessons at our school this year on that. Again, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I know that we will, as a, as a high schooler, I will work harder on trying to make sure that we have those resources available and more widely known. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up this panel. So thank you everyone for being on our panel tonight. We really appreciate everything that you had to say. And I will hand it back over to Tatum for our closing. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up really quick, but um, I just wanted to say if you filled out, if you were part of our survey today, if you filled out the first part of the survey and you didn't get the second part of the survey, come over and stop over here so we can get your feedback. And if you were confused about them looking almost identical, that is because we wanted to see where you were at for the first survey and then after our event, if anything changed, um, if you feel like you learned something, that's what that is for. Um, lastly, we have some refreshments and food left over if you'd like to go over there. And if you would like to get some pamphlets and flyers for some suicide um, awareness and prevention from the hashtag you matter group, they have a booth over here. Thank you all for coming. Have a great night.